Well, it gives me great pleasure today to welcome you all to the Dementia Centre for Research Collaboration um, event on um, culture at the centre of ageing research and dementia prevention with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, and I'd just like to introduce Mr Donovan, who is going to give us a welcome to country. Um, and Terry is a Gambangji and Baripi man, elder and senior research translation coordinator for the Kui Growing Old Well Study and other research and translation projects with the Aboriginal Health and Ageing Program at Neuroscience Research Australia. So over to Terry. Thank you, Karen. As a Gumbangji Baripi man on the mid-north coast of New South Wales, I'd like to welcome you here to to this uh, workshop uh, seminar today and pay my respects in particular to my ancestors and my elders who are Biripai and Gumbangia people. Uh, I also extend that respect to all the other countries that uh, our people are, are on today and listening to, uh, to this program. You've, you've got my respect as well and everyone in, in the workshop itself. So, uh, all my respects to you as well. Thank you, Terry. Um, I'd like to just acknowledge that um, I'm speaking to you as well from um, Bidjigal land today. So I'd like to pay my respects um, to the traditional custodians of the land and the elders past and present. My name's Kylie Radford, um, and it's a great pleasure for um, our team to present this webinar to you this afternoon. Um, so to start with, I'm just going to give a little bit of background uh, about the work that we do um, and some of our, our key research projects before I hand over to my colleagues today who will be delivering the key part of this presentation, which of course is focused on culture at the centre of ageing research and dementia prevention. So joining me today is, um, is Terry Donovan, who you've heard from already, and also our colleagues, Sharon Wall, Wendy Allen, Kylie Sullivan, Lauren Poulos, and Louise Lafrenzik. And we've all worked together um, for several years now, and um, we're really excited to have this opportunity to share that work with you this afternoon. So just to set the scene, um, I think it's important to note um, that um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population is ageing and ageing very rapidly. So current projections um, prepared by Jeremy Temple and colleagues show that um, within the next 30 years or so, there'll be over half a million um, older Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living in Australia. Uh, and many of those will be um, here with us in, in New South Wales, but of course distributed right around the country. Alongside these projections, we've seen um, a number of studies, probably over the last 10 to 15 years, start to look at the rates of dementia among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations. And this, this slide sort of summarises, I guess, a few of the key studies that have been done to date. And what has been quite a consistent finding across all of these studies in whether it be remote, regional or urban areas of Australia, um, is that the rates of dementia uh, are significantly higher among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations compared to the general Australian population. And we think that's in the order of magnitude of about three to five times higher. So taken together with this, um, this knowledge of the ageing population and knowing that um, among Abri Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, just like every other population in the world, that age is the strongest risk factor for dementia, we can see um, that there are likely to be more and more people living with dementia in the coming decades. And dementia prevention in that context is really becoming a community priority. So our work um, in New South Wales has been largely focused on uh, a work, uh, a study called the Koori Growing Old Well Study, which we, we often refer to as KGAL, so you might hear that during the webinar today. Now this, um, this study uh, recruited initially a population-based cohort, so 62% of the total population across these five communities in urban Sydney and up on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. Um, and this work, um, the recruitment for this study um, occurred between 2010 and 2012 initially. So that included 336 people aged 60 years and older. Now, the background to this study, of course, um, started many, many years uh, before that. Um, but this was our key sort of initial data collection period. More recently, we've been able to go back 
uh, to that same group of people and follow up as many people as we can. And that was completed uh, in 2018. So the work done recently in our follow-up study, um, I'm, I'm proud to say was supported by the Dementia uh, Collaborative Research Centres and the prevention stream in particular. So we're really grateful for that, that support to enable us uh, to complete that study, which was to look at the longitudinal social and biomedical risk factors for incident dementia and cognitive decline in urban and regional Aboriginal Australians. So just briefly um, to share with you some of the key findings of that work uh, and why it's relevant, I guess, to dementia prevention is um, we need to understand, I guess, a lot more about what's driving the higher rates of dementia that we're seeing in the population. Um, and this, in, this um, entails learning more about the risk factors for dementia, as well as the protective factors and what keeps our brains healthy across the life course um, and helps us to age well and delay or avoid the onset of dementia in later life. So our initial study highlighted a range of factors across the whole life course that may be contributing to a higher risk of dementia in this population. And this included things like um, early life stress and adversity or childhood trauma, um, midlife work opportunities was also a strong predictor of the likelihood of being diagnosed with dementia in later life. And we saw um, higher rates of other sort of acquired brain injuries or neurological conditions, which also led to a higher risk of developing dementia. So things like uh, traumatic brain injury or head injury with loss of consciousness, stroke and epilepsy. Our more recent follow-up study has enabled us to um, look, look more closely, I guess, at risk factors over time. So we followed up people for about six years on average and were able to look at those with a new onset of dementia or a new onset of mild cognitive impairment or MCI. Um, so again, you'll see some, some of the same risk factors occurring, things like unskilled work in particular, which points to that kind of social context around the risk uh, for dementia. But we also saw some additional factors in our longitudinal work, and this included um, men being at higher risk of developing dementia, um, people with taking multiple um, medications, so polypharmacy in late life was also a risk factor. Hearing and vision problems emerged alongside education. Um, and this state, in this study, we were able to start looking um, as well at some of the genetic risk factors for dementia. And we know that APOE4 genotype um, are in many populations around the world does um, increase the risk of late onset dementia. And we, we saw that here um, among Aboriginal people as well. Um, so I guess there's a real emphasis globally at the moment on dementia prevention and a lot of understanding more about these risk factors and having models um, for risk, dementia risk reduction. And I think this is really important and many of you will have seen um, some of these models in recent years which have highlighted um, that um, reducing dementia risk factors could in fact um, lower the, the number of people experiencing dementia by about 30 or 40 percent worldwide and this is really exciting. Um, and you might have seen uh, in particular the Lancet Commission and their beautiful risk reduction or risk factor model, um, which is now sort of shared um, very widely. Uh, but I guess in the context of um, dementia prevention with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and with many other sort of pop populations who um, perhaps haven't been included uh, in dementia research, um, it's important to note that these risk reduction models are, are basically as good as the data that we've got available um, that informs those models. So um, as Karen Ancy and her colleagues have pointed out that the data that we have at the moment about dementia risk and um, risk reduction uh, comes from a pretty narrow slice of our global community. Uh, and there are many populations around the world, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who do not um, have data um, and research evidence um, that is included in those risk reduction models. That's not to say that they're not relevant. I think that there are a number of very important risk, risk, risk factors and um, avenues for risk reduction to be learned or gleaned from those models. But it's just to highlight that um, there's still quite a lot of work to be done to ensure that we have um, very inclusive um, knowledge and understanding and approaches to dementia risk reduction and dementia prevention.
some of the things that are particularly missing, I think, from those models are um, information about um, early life factors and how they contribute to dementia risk. And also importantly, um, when we're thinking about um, many populations, how do the cultural determinants of health and cultural factors feed into um, dementia prevention as well? Here's a model um, um, published recently in the Medical Journal of Australia, and it's from the Mai Kuayu study. And I think this is really important work, which is starting to help us um, understand more of these cultural determinants of health through finding better ways to sort of quantify and, and conduct this population level or epidemiological research into health and wellbeing. And hopefully in the future, we'll see some of this applied in the dementia, um, the dementia research space as well. So that's just a really brief introduction um, to help you understand, I guess, where we're coming from. But we didn't want to dwell too much on, on that work today. Um, just to say that the Career Growing Old Well study, I guess, has been um, a key component of our work over the years. And I think of it really as like the trunk of a tree and it's it's been growing. But at the same time, we've also been branching off into many other different areas of research and different projects. Uh, in terms of knowledge translation as well. And this is the focus of the webinar today. So when we got together as a group initially, um, I, I didn't take us long, I think, to, um, to come to the conclusion that what we really wanted to share with you this afternoon, rather than you know, the same old story about um, social and health disparities is a focus on um, <laughs> what makes people strong and what is- Stay um, there, stay. I'll just get you to- um, Mute yourself, maybe, Kylie. Um, and sorry, I've lost my train of thought, but what, what we wanted to focus on today were these cultural determinants and these cultural aspects, both of um, dementia prevention and risk reduction, but also the very work that we do um, to learn more and understand those factors as well. So I'm just gonna hand over now to um, my colleague, Kylie Sullivan, who will talk you through today's um, webinar presentation. Thanks, Kylie. Thanks, Kylie. Apologies about that. Um, Kinnegay, my name is Kylie Sullivan and I'm a research assistant with the Aboriginal Health and Ageing Program based here on the mid-north coast of New South Wales on beautiful Gumbangia country. As Kylie previously mentioned, today's webinar will focus on the cultural aspects of dementia prevention through the lens of a community-based team working with Aboriginal peoples and organisations across both rural and urban areas of New South Wales. Drawing on our collective experiences in dementia research and knowledge translation, we address the question, how is culture central to all that we do? Firstly, Uncle Terry Donovan will share with us his perspectives on the meaning of the culture and its central role in understanding connections to mind, body and spirit. Uncle Terry is a highly respected Gumbangia Biripai elder and also the senior research translation coordinator with our team. Second, our colleagues Sharon Wall and Dr Wendy Allen, who have been working with the Aboriginal Health and Ageing Program at Neura for more than a decade now, will share their insights into the ways culture underpins and the research and knowledge translation process. And finally, we will present examples of our research and translational projects, which have all stemmed from the Koori Growing Old Well study. The three short presentations, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Koori will explore the ways in which culture has informed and guided our work and has also emerged as a central aspect of the research findings. findings. These presentations will include Caring for Spirit by Lauren Polis and Sharon Wall, Naranga Ginane, which is Bumbangia for Thinking Peacefully, and that'll be presented by Dr. Louise Laverensick and Mr. Terry Donovan, and myself and Dr. Wendy Allen will be presenting on sharing the wisdom of our elders. And we'd also like to you to join us for a QA and a at the end of these talks. And just to remember, throughout this webinar, we hope to highlight the ways that strength-based approaches to understanding cultural diversity in brain health and dementia prevention have an important role to play in reducing health disparities and promoting equitable ageing and longevity outcomes. I'm going to now hand you over to Uncle Terry to set the scene. Thanks, Uncle Terry. 
Thank you, Kylie. <clears throat> what does culture mean to me? As a older Gumbangian man, culture has been a big part of my life uh, for a long, long time. And, and culture is, is basically what I am. I'm, I'm, I base all my life on everything that I do around the culture. As I reflect on my life, I realize that my people or ancestors and still our elders have cared for this country for thousands of years. Aboriginal culture is a way of living within the environment you are born into, a learned way of surviving within that environment that our people have carved from the land, Mother Earth. Learning to live in harmony with the animals, the birds, the land and the seas respecting the people and all that live on this earth. And creating ways to live and survive in a harsh environment, creating laws that govern all aspects of Aboriginal life, such as customs and, and beliefs, family structure and kinship, marriage, codes of conduct, mutual obligation, reciprocity and payback, trade, access, custodianship and knowledge and sharing obligations. And still we remain the oldest continuing culture on the planet as we acknowledge that our sovereignty was never ceded. Thinking about healthy brain aging, how is culture linked to healthy minds, bodies and spirits for Aboriginal people as they grow older? Leading on from what culture means to me, it is, also, it is also important to all Aboriginal people, healthy brain, healthy body, is being connected to self, connected to family, connected to the environment and connected to mob. When we are connected to all these things, it means everything is right in the world. Our elders realized this for a long time that being connected to self and country in today's environment, we are seeing older Aboriginal people as well as younger people becoming aware that, that to keep brain and body healthy, we must look after our minds and bodies and become active. How have you sought to embed strength and cultural and instruction, cultural knowledge, practice and values within the ageing and dementia research. Most people believe that training is the appropriate term for learning. Aboriginal people know that sitting, yarning and reflecting on how to achieve most things in life is the most effective way. Initially embedding culture, not cultural knowledge into our team to understand practices and values that Aboriginal people practice for thousands of years. My work involved imparting knowledge, my knowledge, onto the team and then continuing that learning process by having cultural reflections as part of our weekly staff meetings. Learning about Aboriginal history or Australian history, which we can say started at the time of colonisation. Learning about Aboriginal people's world views. This reflection each week continues the learning process to allow our team to work appropriately with Aboriginal communities. Understanding the history of this land since colonisation is, is so very necessary to give you an understanding of all the devastation that Aboriginal people have endured. Massacres, genocide, loss of land, loss of language, removal of children, put into institutions, the trauma that these children suffered, Mark them for life, being subject to constant brainwashing, abuse, both sexual and physical. And so the cycle continues. Continuing on with, with the trauma that our stolen generation have suffered, although uh, although that although that we we know a lot about what really, what happened when they were taken away from their families. And we also know the devastation and the horrors they put up with while they're in these uh, institutions. 
not being able to uh, to laugh and talk in the language and so on. And if you didn't know what to do, the girls in particular were abused physically. And at night they feared, they lived in dormitory styled housing and they feared that those footsteps of a night coming down, coming down into, into their, uh, where they slept of a night. And these children feared those footsteps so much they would, they would cry silently and wet the bed. And all these things continued all from their time that they were taken away from their families till they were 15, 16, 17, 18 year old when they were left. And when they become adults, what was the biggest thing for them was to try and find their families. Trying to find their mother, their father, their mob. And that search went on it was uh, for years and years after. Some were very lucky to find their mother or father or their mob, but others weren't so lucky. They weren't so lucky in finding their people. So as life goes on, these people become, they get married and they have their own families. And the way they were treated and the way they were brainwashed, that cycle continued with their own children. And those children suffered at the hands of their parents who, who had no, no idea of, of how to embrace their own children, how to give them love. So that cycle continued on and it, it continues on with their children who are taught those ways. And a lot of these kids were told that they weren't, associate, weren't allowed to associate with Aboriginal kids in, in their schools, although they were Aboriginal and black. Their parents and particularly fathers who have gone through that forbid their children to have any association with other black kids. And these kids grow up with that anxiety and trauma of, of not being able to socialize with their own people. So as I said earlier, this cycle continues on and on through generation after generation. And the bottom line is we are still subject to what the white man brought into this country through colonization, through, through the greed of wanting land, the greed of, of controlling another race and the greed of, of uh, pushing people off their land so they can use that land for themselves. And that trauma is, is still part of us today. So I hope you understand a little bit about culture itself. And I hope you understand that how important it is for the rest of Australia, not just Aboriginal people, for the rest of Australia to know their history. It is so important to know exactly what happened from the time of colonization right up until today. We're still faced with racism today, which is a sad thing. Why should we, what is it, 2021, and why should we still suffer those other things while, while white men continues to walk along and, and in their own tracks and we're walking in our own, own tracks and we can't come together to eliminate all these, all these anxieties and atrocities that have happened to us. So thank you. So I'd just like to hand over, thank you, Uncle Terry. That was um, really heartfelt and I think a really important context for us um, as we think about the impacts um, of culture and what it means and um, where we can draw strength um, from those cultural connections as well as we move forward. Uh, I'd now like to hand over 
to um, Sharon Wall and Dr. Wendy Allen, who will talk a little bit more about the ways um, that we have endeavoured to embed culture in our, our research and knowledge translation process. I'd like to start by acknowledging and paying respect to the traditional owners of the diverse lands on which we remotely meet today and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us. I'd also like to acknowledge the elders that guide our work and give, that, give their permission for us to speak about some Aboriginal cultural issues. I also extend my uh, acknowledgement to my colleagues who've contributed to this research over many years. And from me, a heartfelt thanks to Uncle Terry for his presentation as well. Thank you, Uncle. And Shaz, were you going to say a few words? Yeah. Um, just by way of introduction, um, Wendy and I have been asked to talk to you about the impact of culture on our research and translation and what underpins that. And we thought the way that we might do that, uh, I guess, firstly, from the outset, acknowledging that culture underpins everything we do. Um, as a team, both within our team and in the community. Um, but we thought we might talk to you a little bit about that in terms of how it underpins our development um, as a team and also how it underpins our research and relationships um, in community. Um, and all of which sort of comes together um, to provide, you know, authentic translational um, research processes. So I might just hand over to Wendy, who's going to talk to you about the impact of culture on our research practices in community. Thanks again, Sharon. So this presentation today will detail some of the uh, journey of an ongoing program of ageing and dementia research and knowledge translation in partnership with Aboriginal communities in urban and regional New South Wales. Um, KGALS, as Kylie Radford just um, introduced, KGALS and related projects spanned the years 2008 to 2021 and is ongoing. However, the background work and responding to community needs and identifying gaps in services and Aboriginal specific ageing research began as early as 1992 with Professor Tony Bro. Um, Kylie's given us some great background to start us off, but just to emphasise that KGALS found higher rates of dementia in older Aboriginal people from urban and um, regional areas to, compared to non-Aboriginal Australians. Um, more recently, a follow-up study has been completed that was 2016 to 2018 with a, alongside a range of ongoing translational projects, which others will present today. There's been an emphasis in those translation projects uh, on highlighting stories of resilience and ageing well. So how do we do this? And how do we continue this research, which embeds culture as the centre? Um, since the colonisation of Australia by European colonists, Australia's first people um, have experienced trauma, as Uncle Terry mentioned, um, and that trauma has been from the loss of culture and land, as well as from the removal of children and lack of rights as citizens. And as a team, we have listened and we've learned about this from our cultural guides. And with that knowledge of trauma and dispossession at the forefront of our minds, our team have adopted, opted rather, for a decolonising model to frame our work a central component of our research has always been to ensure that the research would be conducted in an ethical way, which was respectful of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's beliefs, and that the findings would also incorporate the oral history traditions and other traditions like art and storytelling. This model and practices are constantly reviewed by their research team. So what about the meaning of health and wellbeing? Um, as Professor Judy Atkinson, a well-known Indigenous academic, explains, Indigenous people's worldview hasn't got any equivalence in Western terminology, but it is shaped by individuals' experiences, history, culture and values. She also goes on to say that health from an Aboriginal perspective incorporates a whole-of-life outlook 
and not only focuses on the social, emotional and cultural well-being of individuals, but it's the whole community that this is shaped by. Gumbangia woman Alison Page also explains that the continued connection to country brings a cultural education and respect for all people, and it's fundamental to survival and well-being. These beliefs we know are congruent with the life course approach that's been adopted in KGAUS. An emphasis on um, partnerships as part of our research pro process has also been important to maintain and retain Aboriginal community control over the research process. Um, it's, it aims to empower and build capacity of local research capabilities through an active involvement in decisions and research and all health related ma matters. We also formalise partnerships with Aboriginal controlled health organisations where possible. And that's to plan, identify needs with partners and respond to community needs and listen carefully to their input. So from the beginning, 2009, the Koori Growing Old Well Study team met regularly to discuss, debate, and refine the cultural appropriateness and scientific quality of KGALS. Um, an Aboriginal reference group has been established back in 2009, and that continues today, along with local community guidance groups. And they give support um, advice and they provide overall governance of our work. Community-based staff meet regularly with elders and health teams in services um, to, just to give support and advice and as well um, we update them regularly on the progress of projects. There's key uh, Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council documents that guide us and ethics approvals allow the research to begin, but ultimately it's the community that are the drivers of our work. So with this knowledge and guided by elders and experienced researchers, the team have listened deeply. We've learnt a lot and we hope that we've walked respectfully. Well, we know that we've walked respectfully in this research journey where KGALS and the related projects and studies are playing an important role in identifying aged care and dementia service needs and developing culturally responsive strategies for raising awareness, reducing dementia risk and aging well. Um, we're gonna talk about some translational research pro projects um, in a little while, but first up, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Sharon Wall now, who's gonna to talk to us a little bit about knowledge translation and capacity building. Thanks, Jazz. Thanks, Wendy. Um, as a non-Aboriginal researcher, um, I wanted to take the opportunity to share some of the elements that we continue to refine and expand upon as Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal researchers working together side by side in the Aboriginal ageing research space. These elements continue to underpin our relationship development and enhancement as a research team and contribute to a model that we take out to our communities, as Wendy's just pointed out. Wisdom-led leadership is at the centre of this model and is pivotal to this team. That refers to both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal leadership, where wisdom has become both an expected and respected cultural component of this team, whether that be evidence research-based or culturally based. This leadership informs practices and approaches to meeting the needs of Aboriginal people through all the businesses that we do. Respect and trust are the fundamentals, as you would know, of all relationship building. But the addition of compassion assures that we can, through truth telling and story, acknowledge the history of deep pain and do whatever we can to alleviate that pain. We've developed a co-mentoring model of relationship building, which applies across our team to include cultural, clinical and research practices, as well as human relationships. Our Aboriginal colleagues provide cultural mentorship and cultural leadership to us as non-Aboriginal researchers, whilst we as non-Aboriginal researchers assist and support each other and build strengths in the clinical and research space. Communicating with humility and with an understanding of the impact on culture, on communication, assures that we continue to improve our communication practices by looking and listening and using our words well. 
We work in a trauma-informed way and appreciate and fully realise the impact of cross-generational trauma and continue to add to our own learnings in that space. We are then guided into utilising strength-based and healing responses when working with team and community. We undertake mutual across team capacity building with respect, knowledge and understanding. But this is not capacity building for capacity building's sake, but rather building on strengths, developing goals and supporting aspirations together. Summer May Finlay, a strong Aboriginal woman, has written widely on being the best ally to Aboriginal people. She reaffirms that Aboriginal people can't raise the profile of issues affecting them without allies and subsequently provides guidance about what a good ally looks like. She invites us to be good non-Aboriginal allies by saying something when we hear someone say inappropriate things about Aboriginal people, by calling out racism, by not expecting Indigenous people to educate us, we must educate ourselves appreciating the diversity among Indigenous people and promoting the Indigenous voices and being prepared to not be part of decision-making, that is not the decision-maker, but supporting but not leading, and most importantly, to continue to turn up. So in turning up as a team, we continue to be thirsty for information, facts, understandings, beliefs, experiences, attitudes, stories and guidance which enrich our understandings and allow us to view the world and subsequently our work through the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lens, which all leads us to checking in and reflecting regularly and leading us towards walking gently in peace together as a team and taking those essentials into our communities also as we undertake our research. So I hope you can then subsequently appreciate just from this small yarning time, how culture impacts on all that we do as the Aboriginal Health and Ageing Program at Neura, and how that subsequently impacts on the genuineness and authenticity of the transferable outcomes from our research back to our communities. And it just beholds me to acknowledge and thank all the people in this slide who um, represent our team. Thank you. Oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot. I'm handing over, of course, to um, my colleague, uh, Lauren Poulos, who's going to talk to you about caring for spirit. Thanks. Thanks, Sharon and Wendy. Um, I'm so pleased to have this opportunity to present today. My name is Lauren Poulos, and I'm a Birupai woman working as a project coordinator on the Caring for Spirit project. So the presentation that I'm going to go through today is Caring for Spirit, an online dementia resource for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. I'd just like to acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional owners on the lands of which I'm talking to you from today, which is the Gadigal people of the Oro Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. So um, the Caring for Spirit project was funded and supported by the Australian Government Department of Health, Dementia and Aged Care Service Fund. The initial submission drew on research undertaken nationally from the Koori Growing Old World Study and the Koori Dementia Care Project, which sought to identify the need for appropriate resources to raise awareness of dementia in this population. This research was translated into culturally relevant and accessible information, education and training to inform, educate and train people from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander backgrounds and mainstream organisations interacting with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with dementia. It ad additionally draws on research from a number of areas addressing dementia literacy in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations. So, um, Growing old well is something we want for our communities. What we know is that growing old well is influenced by many things that happen throughout our lives. Getting dementia can have an effect on our minds, bodies and spirit. So why did we call the project Caring for Spirit? Essentially, it came out of consultation with the community. We were informed by a number of sources who viewed dementia as a sick spirit. So here on this slide are two quotations that highlight this in terms of the view of a number of different Aboriginal people talking about dementia. It then provided a, a focused opportunity for us to consider dementia in a more holistic and healing sense. And it encouraged us to put resources together that impacted on spirit as well as emotion and body. 
So the Caring for Spirit resource provides information and education about dementia for people and services from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and mainstream, mainstream organisations working with older Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The resources include information on dementia prevention and reducing risks. There are also many links to other resources for reducing risks and preventing dementia. Through a website and online learning modules, Caring for Spirit provided technical-based solution to inform and educate people from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and mainstream, mainstream organisations working with older Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people about dementia. These resources support people living with dementia and their carers. So the Caring for Spirit project sought to develop a dementia education website and online training program for the Aboriginal health and aged care workforce, as well as for family caregivers. Resource development applied the following overarching principles. So dementia information was produced from Aboriginal cultural perspective for grounding research evidence and lived experience in Aboriginal populations. The project was led by an Aboriginal project manager and engaged Aboriginal consultants throughout. Training was designed using appropriate and engaging learning methods. Resources needed to be accessible to a wide range of users, taking into consideration cultural diversity, technology access, disabilities, and literacy levels. And extensive community consultation and engagement guided the development and dissemination of these of the resources. So the Caring for Spirit website can be accessed via caringforspirit.org.au. We work closely with NGNY, an Aboriginal owned and operated digital agency for the graphic designs, branding, icons, infographics and website designs. So infographics are used to visually represent the research findings. And throughout the website, you will find some videos where we have people telling their stories and experience with dementia. So, and then the overarching aim of the Caring for Spirit online learning modules is to provide information about what dementia is and recognising the signs and symptoms, to recognise and validate Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural perspectives and discuss these in a the context of providing appropriate symptom support, regardless of underlying belief systems, to emphasise the importance of seeking assessment and support and of appropriate professional involvement, to provide information about lifelong experiences and behaviours that may influence the development of dementia and accordingly ideas for minimising risks. To provide practical ideas and tips for supporting an individual with dementia. And the Caring for Spirit online learning module's primary target audience is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander aged care workers, but it is also relevant to carers and other supporting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders living with or displaying symptoms of dementia. So each set Training module uses sections of the Sharing the Wisdom of Our Elders artwork by Glennie Naden. So on this slide, we have a screenshot of Glennie's beautiful artwork, which she says represents the themes of culture and dream time, spirituality, sacred grounds, sharing the wisdom of our elders, and the effects of dementia on our aging po Indigenous population. Glennie is a primary carer of her mum, who is living with dementia. To complement the website, an interactive online training module featured exploratory non-linear progression across four modules, reflective exercises and voice over narrations and multimedia. Throughout the Caring for Spirit learning modules, you'll find some multimedia videos and interviews where we have people telling their stories and experience with dementia. So for the multimedia presentation, we work with Black Block Media, which is an Aboriginal owned media production house. So we're just going to play you here one of the multimedia uh, presentations. Now you've learned about how important our brains are for everything we do. And we understand more about how our brains work and what can happen if different areas of our brain are damaged, it is easy to see why looking after our brains is so important. So let's learn about the things that make our brains healthy. And as a result, our minds, bodies, spirits, and communities strong. Exercise makes our brains strong. So what's your jam? Can you slam dunk? Do you run like the wind? Are you deadly with balls and bats? Like a bit of yoga or a nice early morning walk. Doesn't matter really. 
The moral of this story is just keep moving. Exercise is good for our brains. Our brains are soft, fatty bits of jelly inside that tough noggin of a skull. So we can injure our brains easily. Protect those heads. Wear helmets if you're riding, headgear if you're playing footy. That brain of yours is worth protecting. Some say you can't teach an old dingo new tricks, but research says that that is not true. We can learn things and keep our brains active at any age. Ever wanted to learn a musical instrument? Love a word puzzle? Like to try and smash through that 1000 piece puzzle? Or learn a new craft? Keep learning. This makes our brains strong. Who loves big mob get togethers? Big mob, little mob. Did you know that doing things together, building connections, yarns, games, stories, teaching, all these things are good for our brains. Another excuse for a big mob get together, eh? As if we needed one. You can't run that troopy without clean fuel, eh? Our bodies are the same. We need good, clean fuel. Healthy foods, lots of water, and steering clear of all the things that clog the fuel lines, like grog or ciggies. Good clean fuel is a strong brain rule. Have you heard that good old saying, prevention is better than cure? Well, that's true when it comes to our brains. Our general health can impact on our brains. So staying on top of our general health is really important. Don't put off that health check. Go see the doc, make sure everything is in good working order, and try to look after yourself. Healthy body, healthy brain. So we had lots of people contributing to our project and we're very grateful for that. So we just wanted to say thanks to the Aboriginal Health and Ageing team at Neura and all our community research participants and community contributors. So now I'll hand you over to Louise and Uncle Terry who will be presenting on Nering Again and A. Thanks Lauren. Um, and I'd just like to thank Uncle Terry as well for his uh, welcome to country earlier. Um, and I would also like to pay my respects um, and acknowledge that we're all meeting on Aboriginal land um, and pay my respects to Elders past and present and um, all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining this webinar today. And I will just pass over to Uncle Terry to start off um, speaking about our program. Uncle Terry, I think you're just on mute there. Thank you, Louise. Sorry about that. Uh, going on from what Louise had just said, as you have heard today, a lot of our, our, uh, our work, the work our team does is on ageing well and dementia in Aboriginal communities. Something that often comes up as being important is mental health, which affects Aboriginal people at a higher rate and can also increase people's risk of dementia. This all comes from colonization and the trauma and history that was imposed upon us as Aboriginal people. Our research and partnership with community is what led to us developing the Naranga Ginane program. The program responds to a community identified need to address the impacts that stress and trauma throughout life can have, especially as as people get older. Culture and mindfulness. A lot of thought went into the type of program that would be suitable for Aboriginal people to try and reduce the impacts of stress and trauma. After a lot of discussion amongst our team and other community partners, we decided that a mindful, mindfulness-based program would be culturally appropriate and could work for Aboriginal people. Mindfulness for Aboriginal people is, is about connection. And it is something that Aboriginal people have practiced for thousands of years. Different communities have different names for mindfulness. And from speaking with participants, it is clear that many people are doing things in their lives that count, count as mindful, mindfulness practice without being called mindfulness. 
I'll now pass back to Louise to talk, talk more about the program itself. Thank you, Louise. Thanks, Uncle Terry. Um, so now I'll talk a little bit about the pilot study that we did for the program, which was recently published and funded by the Aging Futures Institute. So we didn't want to go through a process of co-design, as it's often known, that was sort of surface level or tokenistic. Instead, we really wanted to make sure that all stages involved input from Aboriginal people and also community members. So the way that we did this was initially we spoke with our, um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Steering Committee who oversees a lot of our research and other projects and they provided support for the approach that we were using. We then uh, convened an expert working group which included Aboriginal and non-Indigenous clinicians, researchers and an elder and we held workshops to decide what the program might look like. Then we went on to work with a local organisation in Coffs Harbour and we spoke with local elders and community members to help us design the program and see what their preferences were in terms of what a program should look like. And the way that we did that was to hold a yarning group and then based on the feedback from community members, we were able to make further changes before we finalised the structure and the content of the program. So this next slide just gives an overview of what the program looks like. Um, so as the basis, we used a, um, an existing sort of set out program called mindfulness-based stress reduction. So this includes teaching and activities related to mindfulness and connection, uh, but we did adapt the content and exercises so that it was more culturally appropriate. There were eight sessions in total and each of them ran for about an hour and a half. And each of the sessions had a theme and you can see these um, on the, the left hand side of this, this table. The content then included information about mindfulness and psychoeducation, along with breathing and awareness exercises. And then each session finished off with some informal yarning time and also a morning tea. And so some of the ways that we adapted the program to be more culturally appropriate included having poems in Gumbangir language and also ensuring that the facilitators were Aboriginal people and could talk about things in a cultural way. So I'll now just share some poems that were created and translated into Gumbangir language, uh, especially for the program. And so Lindy Moffat was one of the facilitators and a few weeks into the program, she came up with these quotes and translated them with guidance from the local language center. Here's an example of one quote. Um, the river flows fast like my mind. I need to slow my mind down, think and breathe. And so these poems really resonated with participants and ended up being very, a very important part of the program. And so the second one that she, that Lindy Moffat um, came up with and translated was, I listen to my ancestors. I have deep thinking and connectedness. I am mindful and this keeps me well. So this next figure, shows the whole process of development, piloting and follow up with the community. Um, so we followed up with community after we finished the program as well. And that was really important and was identified as important through our consultation as well. So people kind of indicated, um, you know, we can't just sort of go in, do this program, go away, and then nothing ever comes of it. Um, so it's really important to translate that work back. Um, and that was highlighted in our consultation. And so seven people participated in the trial and generally we had really good attendance rates across the eight sessions. And as I mentioned, this, this program was co-facilitated um, by Uncle Terry, who's a local elder, and also another, um, so Lindy Moffat, who has experience with in mental health. And so in terms of um, the outcomes of the pilot study, so Participants fed back to us that they felt the program really helped them in some way. So one participant said, I'd be doing something and my mind would be somewhere else, but now I tend to keep it where it is. Many people also liked the mindful eating exercise where we, we had, you know, for instance, a piece of fruit and um, they had to think about the sensations and, and their senses as they were eating. And they found that this helped them with managing portion sizes and thinking about what they ate outside of the program as well. 
We also saw a pattern for reductions in depression, anxiety and stress scores, blood pressure, and also people reported that they noticed some benefits to chronic pain that they'd had before starting the program. And so overall participants said that they liked the group setting and having content like the poems in language as well. Another key outcome were suggestions for program improvement. So we did ask participants about this explicitly. So for example, one person highlighted the importance of making sure that the content was communicated in a way that everyone could relate to. So they said, you know, bringing it to Koori English. And a few participants also commented that the name of one of the activities, which was originally called a body scan, made them think of medical procedures. So we've since changed this instead to a name in language, which means tie to body. So I'll now pass back to Uncle Terry to give some reflections. Thank you, Louise. Originally, when we started talking about developing this program, I was not sure whether it would be, would be right for, for our people. But when I saw how participants responded to the program, it really surprised me. And I noticed that participants remembered the elements were part of, of their memory, especially as young adults. Mindfulness is about being connected to self, family and country. And that is what we focused on in the program. I was also reminded of past memory through the feel, the touch, the smell and taste of things. And what we spoke about in the sessions. The outcomes, by running this program, we, we could see that it worked for people and was acceptable. We also used this trial as a way to work out what else needed to be changed. It is likely that this program was accepted because we co-designed co it from the very beginning. Lindy also made the point that by incorporating language, participants really felt like they had ownership of the program, which is what our goal was from the very start. We also made sure that we went back to the community afterwards and shared what we had found and our plans to keep the program going. Uh, and, I'll, and I think we're also going to continue this program in a larger scale in the coming year. So I'll pass back to, to Louise. Thanks, Uncle Terry. Um, yeah, absolutely. So next year, we're going to be running a larger trial. And we're also in the process um, of currently adapting the program for other communities as, as um, part of that trial as well. And so just on this next slide, um, we'll show you some front, the front covers of the resources that we've created um, based on the pilot study. So these include a facilitator manual and also some handouts for participants. Um, so we've worked with the graphic designer to incorporate some artwork from another one of our projects, Sharing the Wisdom, um, which is a nice segue um, to pass on to Kylie and Wendy to talk about the Sharing the Wisdom project in more detail now. Fantastic. Thanks, Louise and Uncle Terry. And hello again. And we'd just like to start with an acknowledge acknowledgement of country also. Um, we'll start by, we'd like to acknowledge all of the Aboriginal nations whose lands we meet on today and pay our respect to the traditional custodians of all these lands and their elders past and present. I also extend my respect to all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. And I'd also acknowledge all the people who have contributed to our research and knowledge translation projects over the many years. And I'll just hand it over to Wendy. Thanks, Wendy. with me. Thanks so much, Kylie, and thanks, Louise and Terry, for your presentation too. Um, so just a little bit about ageing in Aboriginal communities um, to start us off. We know that dementia prevalence is shown to be higher in urban and regional Aboriginal communities and the broader Australian population, and we've talked a little bit about that today. Um, just to stress that this rate is similar than to the rates for remote Aboriginal Australians. However, there is an increasing number and proportion of older Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and average life expectancy is actually increasing. It's currently 72 years for men and 76 years of age for women. 
Next slide, please, Carlos. But with the with those um, higher rates of dementia that we've talked about, understanding the causes and the risk factors is essential when we're look, looking at dementia prevention. There's mounting evidence that indicates that dementia prevention needs to start from actually midlife or even younger. But effectively translating this message to a community level can be quite challenging. KGAS 2 found that many risk factors for dementia are modifiable, and that provides us with opportunities to prevent or delay the onset of dementia. Sharing the, the wisdom of our elders project acknowledge the need for some strength-based resources about ageing well at a community level. We know that older people play a vital role in Aboriginal communities, especially in regards to transferring cultural knowledge and cultural practice, practices. As such, this project, Sharing of the Wisdom, aimed to, doc, aimed to document the resilience, community connectedness and culture while promoting ageing well across the life course through traditional methods like stories and artworks. In addition, the project uh, aimed to identify current services and programs to determine whether these align with the needs and the expectations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population in the communities that we were, we were working with. Um, Sharing the Wisdom is an outcome of the Koori Growing Old World Study and funded by the Luicha Institute. Um, in relation to connectedness to culture, Pegals asked a question, who is your mob? Um, and interestingly and importantly, 91% of participants felt a connectedness to their local Aboriginal communities. I'm going to hand over to Kylie again and she's going to tell us some more about the project. Thanks, Kylie. Thanks, Wendy. Okay, so the Sharing the Wisdom project involved elders from 65 to 95 years old. All of the participants were asked the qualitative open-ended question, over your lifetime, what have you learned that is important for growing old well? The results revealed five main areas of importance, sharing the wisdom of our elders, culture, sacred grounds, spirituality, and dream time. Sharing and passing on knowledge as one aged was revealed to be of significant importance to the participants as it built upon the idea of resilience. Connection to country, spirituality and dream time were described to be interconnected and maintaining such connections was essential to aging well. In addition, sharing knowledge and passing on knowledge as one grows old is critical for old Aboriginal people to live in a good life and ageing well in step with a whole of life view of health and well-being. So sorry, Carl's, um, next slide. Yep, these are, these are some of the growing old well themes our participants talked about. Important factors they believe that contribute to growing well, such as connection to mob and country, respect of elders and all community, passing on knowledge, cultural learning, saying no to smoking and drugs and maintaining a healthy lifestyle to name a few. So in 2019, the World Health Organization's guidelines regarding risk reduction of dementia and cognitive decline included an increase in physical activity, the cessation of smoking, a healthy balanced diet stating that Mediterranean was the best, reducing or limiting alcohol consumption, and to maintain a healthy weight and also the importance of the management of both hypertension and diabetes during midlife. So resilience is the inner strength that helps individuals bounce back and carry on in the face of adversity. One example from our project is a picture in this slide, local artist Glennie Naden, whom Lauren mentioned earlier in her Caring for Spirit talk, Glenny um, is also the carer of her mother who was diagnosed with dementia. She speaks of resilience and here are some of the words from Glenny about her mother. I learned from her how to be strong and resilient and how to face the challenges that came our way. And I think that formidability has helped me to help her at this stage in her life. So to assist in achieving the aims of the project, Aboriginal artists were invited to submit works that identified with the themes of the project. 
In 2018, Aboriginal artists were asked to submit their artworks, which aligned with the aims of the project. Seven artworks were chosen to be incorporated into a range of Aboriginal specific healthy ageing and health promotion resources. Specifically, the winning artwork was created by Glenny, the Aboriginal artist she does identify as a cubby cubby, cower and Wiradjuri woman, and whose quote was on the previous slide. 26 interviews were also conducted with service providers. That was 14 on the mid North Coast and 12 in the Sydney metropolitan area with the aims to identify ways services were contributing to healthy ageing. Such interviews provided insights into successful approaches, challenges, and also the gaps in the services. A number of recommendations for ageing well services are outlined in our final report. It is hoped that more effective models of service delivery and health promotion will be developed. So this project recognises the cultural significance and wisdom of our elders to raise awareness of dementia and promote brain health, dementia prevention across the life course. Older Aboriginal people emphasise cultural practices and values, including respect and resilience as central to growing old well, along with well-established factors for health, longevity and dementia prevention. This project will contribute to dementia prevention and better services through raising community awareness of healthy ageing across the life course, developing empowering educational resources suitable for and accessible to Aboriginal people of all ages, and highlighting the meaning of healthy ageing from the perspective of older Aboriginal people and how these align with our current services. So thank you all so much for listening. We're now going to pop over to the Q&A and hope you enjoyed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kylie, and a big thank you to all of our speakers this afternoon. Um, I also wanted to just finish on um, an acknowledgement slide to um, acknowledge all the amazing people who've contributed to this work over the years and, and many who continue to do so. Um, and I'd also like to thank the, the DCRC and Professor Karen Anstey and, and Dr Nikki Ann Wilson as well for giving us this opportunity to present um, as a collective because it really is um, you know, a collective undertaking. And I, I think that's, um, that's another important aspect of our work to recognize is that we work very much as a team um, and that no individual in the, in the team can really carry this work uh, alone. Um, and so it's really important to acknowledge that, that, um, that group effort and, and the strength that we draw from each other and our different skills and knowledge and experiences. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. Um, we've got a few minutes now um, before we conclude the webinar today um, to answer some of your questions. So I invite you to put um, questions in the, in the chat or the Q&A as you see fit. Um, and I'll do my very best um, to find them all and, um, and pose some of the questions um, to the, the panel that we have before us this afternoon. Um, so I might... Um, so I might just go back to um, the start because I did see a few questions coming through at the beginning. And I also noticed that we've got a few people um, with who've raised their hands. So perhaps I could invite you, if you've got a question to ask, um, the best way might be to, to put that into, into the chat box, if you wouldn't mind. Um, so I've got a, um, a question um, just to, to get things started. And I'd like to... Um, uh, I'd like to perhaps ask you, Kylie, if you wouldn't mind starting off the, the Q&A. And I guess, um, you know, it's it's been a few years now that you've been working in um, the ageing and, and dementia space. And I know you're very passionate about dementia prevention and brain health in particular. Um, so I just wanted, if you wanted to maybe comment on, you know, what, what are the key things that you've learned, particularly um, in engaging with the community and working in that space um, around dementia prevention and what people's needs are and, and how, um, you know, some ideas, I guess, for, um, for contributing to dementia prevention in your community. Okay, uh, that's me. So I'll do my best <laughs> being put on the spot. But um, no, Kyle's, um it's so important and, um, you know, to be raised within our, all our communities. And I think the thing that really sticks with me that I'd heard once is before, you know, entering into, into community, you have to warm the ground. 
you know, you have to go in and, you know, introduce yourself to the elders. And I guess that really does help having Aboriginal people too on board to sort of make that for those first steps. Um, Uncle Terry, um, he's just been an absolutely amazing mentor. And um, I just wanted to give a shout out to the team of what an incredible, wonderful, you know, passionate group of people you all are. And I've um, started from nothing really in the support that I've had over the years from you guys and everything I've learned is just um, incredible and just really empowers me more to, yeah, to really help um, try and close the gap on these high dementia rates. But um, I've probably lost track completely, Coles. <laughs> but, um, yeah. No, that that's excellent, Kylie. Sorry, it was a very wide-ranging question <laughs> that I threw at you as well. So not very focused. Um, but, yeah, no, that's, a, that's wonderful to hear about your experiences. I guess I'd like to ask Sharon a little bit um, about um, her work as well, because um, it has been, um, you know, quite a, a number of years now, I guess, that you've been really working uh, directly with communities and with people and families who are living with dementia um, to help them to access uh, the information and the knowledge and um, the ways that um, I guess people prefer to receive that information information or the things that people really want to know about when it comes to dementia and the types of um, extra what's and services that there's if you want to make some comment on those things uh, yeah Kyle so you just froze on me so I, I think oh I think sorry I got, that's okay I think I got I think I got the question um yeah, I mean, I get again, I think it's very much about listening to community and it's been very much about really listening to community and walking very gently with community and, and with incredible humility, particularly as a non-Aboriginal researcher. Um, and, and really listening to what the community is saying to us. And I, I guess, you know, I just put a response in the chat screen because somebody asked about painting um, that sits behind us. Um, and I was explaining, um, you know, this painting of Mary Jane Pages. But I think that is just such a beautiful example of, of you know, conceptually things that have underpinned our, the very nature of our work from the very outset um, in, in terms of, you know, looking at ageing and looking at dementia um, through an Aboriginal lens and really um, attempting to understand it in that way and responding appropriately. Um, so, yeah, I just, you know, I, I just am filled with humility all the time and you know that and everybody, everybody on our team is um, to have the privilege of being out there and listening and, and attempting to respond um, in, in, you know, in various and appropriate ways. And I mean, we're certainly very committed to translating, um, you know, the research that we undertake and we're all individually and collectively, you know, constantly considering how we take that back to community. And I think that's a real strength um, of the team also. Does that answer your question, Carl? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sharon. <laughs> um, so I should say that um, to the rest of the team, the panel here that, um, you know, we've got had a lot of comments coming through about um, the presentation and, and thanking you all for your, your words and your wonderful work. Um, so I'd just like to um, now go to Uncle Terry, um, if you wouldn't mind, Terry, and, and ask you, what else do you think we could be doing when it comes to um, promoting brain health and, um, you know, strengthening our dementia prevention work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities? Thank you, Kylie. Uh, first thing that springs to mind is the community that, themselves. We've got to become, now look, we're working in Coffs Harbour, Nambucca and Kempsey and, and uh, La Perouse and in the Campbelltown areas. To become part of, that, uh, part of that community, you must be involved in what's happening in the community. And that's one thing I tried to, and, and, and I was quite sex, successful, getting the team to attend Aboriginal events, to attend NAIDOC week, to attend anything that's going on. So the community, community can get to know us and know who we are and what we do. We're not out there to take uh, information away from the community. Yes, we are, to be honest, we are there to, for a reason. But that reason will give us information 
that we can take back and maybe help the community themselves with our dementia research and other research, uh, research as well. So I think it's important for us to become part of the community, not just come in and do the work and, and go away and, 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 you know, and send uh, information back as for us, to, uh, and we've proven this, for Aboriginal, uh, for uh, research organisations, have got to take that step and becoming part of a community, not because they want to do, they need to do the work to extract information. They, what they need to do is become part of that community. So that community can embrace them and the work they're doing. So the community, community can, can see and the reasons why these researchers come into our community. And that's the important thing. You know, for years and years and years, we, we all know that researchers in the early years and middle years, um, people would just come into the community and, and ask questions you know, without, without becoming, uh, uh, opening themselves up to, to the people they're talking to. They, they come in, take information away, take it away and, and never hear from it. One example is one of our last elders who passed away a few years ago, Uncle Tiger Buchanan. He was, he was the subject of a lot of early uh, uh, anthropologists and a lot of researchers in that time. They'd come and tape all the, uh, the stories uh, and his language and so many other things and take away. But, and that never, ever came back to the community until the Murabai Language Centre started up and did and started to research what Uncle Tig imparted with all these others. So they had to chase up to find all that information he gave away so they can bring it back and hold it in the keeping house of the Murabai Language Centre. So, yeah, I think that's... That may cover it, Kylie. Yeah, thank, thank you, Terry. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is, you know, that, that sort of strong uh, connection to communities and that participatory action-based uh, research to make sure that there's this cycle of, um, you know, continually giving back in terms of, of the research and the, the things that we're learning about and the ways that we're sort of, I guess, creating new knowledge together. Um, so thank you. Uh, we, we do have some more questions coming through now, um, and this might be one I throw up to, um, to Wendy and, and to Kylie Sullivan as well, um, just in relation uh, to the wider uh, picture, I guess, of dementia research in Australia. So Kevin Morris has asked, you know, will the project, um, you know, take in other areas um, of, of Australia and other Indigenous peoples, um, or is our work very much limited uh, to the Central Coast in Sydney? So you might like to talk about some of um, the national level co collaborations that you're involved in. Hi, Wayne, I'll let you go if you like. Um, thank you for your question. The, the answer is yes. Um, our work does reach far and wide. Whilst a lot of um, our returning the findings to the communities are directly with the communities that we work with, um, in terms of um, you know report giving back information about reports and publications at a community level, we're also involved in national projects and um, our pu publications reach far and wide nationally and internationally. In terms of a national project, we're involved in a project a study called Let's Chat Dementia, which is um, community approaches to dementia in primary healthcare looking at early, which looks at early detection um, of dementia and um, inter intervention um, in looking at um, reducing the risk of modifiable risk factors. And that's it. that project called Let's Chat Dementia is in partnership with the University of Melbourne. And we're working with um, 12 Aboriginal controlled health organisations around the country. So hopefully that's answered your question. Did you want to add anything to that, Kyles? Just that I would like... Sorry? You're cutting out, Kyles. I can't hear you. I don't know if others can. Sorry, can you hear me now? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, ideally, in the perfect world, I'd love to take our research to every major town and city all over the nation. It's such important work, and uh, um, it's a really scary thing. This dementia, and you know, we're getting it a lot younger, and yeah, yeah. But at the moment, I think we're going okay. Definitely, yep. Yeah, yeah and hopefully, and wide. we're getting the message out there far and wide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's probably a good point to note at that point that, um, you know, the Caring for Spirit website, so caringforspirit.org.au, does include a lot of the resources that we've shared with you today, as well as links to many other uh, resources from other research groups and other organisations that have been um, prepared around uh, living with dementia and ageing well in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. So we've done our best to try and compile all those into, into one location for you to be able to access more readily. Um, so a question here, um, perhaps to the, the whole team, if anyone wants to, to jump in at this point, um, but Dallas McKean says, um, you know, thank you for the presentation. I really liked your strengths-based approach to the project and especially to the team. Are there any key learnings as a team that you can share with us? I, I just really think having that support from everyone, it's it's so empowering and, yeah, yeah, it's incredible the, the support you get. And as I said, having um, Uncle Terry as my main, main mentor has been incredible too. That's really helped. Yeah, but that support, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I add to that, Kyle? Um, as a non-Indigenous researcher, I just always remember that the land that I'm walking on is a mine. And every step that we take in the research journey, it's about walking gently and asking permission along the way and involving key people in the conversations. So that's that's my main key learning. And Lauren, do you want to reflect perhaps on what, what your key learning is about working in, in a team like this or um, in, you know, in, in doing the very sort of collaborative um, and consultative work that you've had to do through bringing together uh, the Caring for Spirit resources? Yeah, so I agree with what, like Kylie said, it's just having that support with the team, um, having with the weekly team meetings, having the um, connect, uh, like culture talks um, that we that we talk and, and hear from Uncle Terry and you know, you know, all the team members contributing to that. Um, yeah, working with the community and understanding getting what they what, what they would like to see in the modules as well as the as well as the websites. Thanks, Lauren. Um, now this question is um, this next question is probably for Louise and um, for Terry as well. Have you ever involved the um, Nunkari, the traditional healers, as part of your research. Um, Uncle, I don't know if you want to comment. I know that, so we haven't sort of formally um, done that, which um, they, they do some amazing work. And I know a lot of um, our team has actually seen them at community um, events and had the privilege to, yeah, sort of go through some of that healing, um, those healing sessions, which have been super valuable. Um, and I think, yeah, there's there's such a it would be so wonderful to be able to to work with them. Um, I think Uncle Terry, probably the the closest thing in terms of our mindfulness program in terms of Naranga Ginane, which we sort of have tried to incorporate, I guess, is um, some of the cultural, more cultural adaptations that we've done. And um, Uncle Terry, you've previously spoken about, you know, incorporating, you know, the leaves and other things into the mindfulness program. So I don't know if you wanted to comment on that or you're happy to comment. Yeah, uh, Louise, firstly, look, uh, we have been invited by the lady who, who uh, runs Nunkari uh, at, uh, we met her and, and the team down in Sydney two or three, three years ago, I think it was. And we had discussions with them and they, they were very interested in the work we do, and as as was us, we were very interested in what they do, which is amazing. So we we uh, sat down and had a yarn about it, and they and they said, look, uh, any time that you want to come and be involved, and 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 uh, just to see how things are done, we're quite, you're quite welcome. And uh, 
you know, and, and that's still uh, on our minds. I think eventually sometime, hopefully we can get them over to New South Wales on, on the mid-north coast in particular. Uh, yeah. Uh, and the program, you know, and the, na, 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 what program is it? Naranga <laughs> Ginane. The na, Naranga Ginane program is, is such a great program because it, it helps Aboriginal people to reflect and go back in, in time. The, the, the smell, the touch of the leaves and, the, and they scrunch it up and the smells of those different leaves brings back certain memories to those people and it takes them to a time, sometimes it's a specific time in their past and they can relate to that straight away, which they have shown us and they've told us about these things, you know, and, and, and that connection to self, country and mob is being part of Aboriginal culture for many, well, 60 odd thousand years. That's always been part of our culture is to, to, to be connected to self. Then you connect to you connected to self. You connected to family. You connected to mob, and so on and so on. And you connect to the environment that you live in, you know. And and that perspective gives you a different view of the world around you. And I think that's so brilliant, you know, that that Aboriginal people have have known this for many thousands of years, and you know, and I don't want to upset anyone. I've known this for many thousands of years and white people are now just starting to realise what, what we've known for a long, long time. Very well said, Terry. Um, now we're almost at time, um, but there is one last question um, that I'd like to, um, to, to pose to the panel, which comes from our, our friend, Kevin Morris. And um, perhaps I can direct this at you, Sharon, but please anyone on the panel, if you'd like to, um, to address this question as well. Um, how can we, how can the interaction between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who have dementia and the wider community be improved as they get, as they get older and their dementia progresses? So any sort of tips, I guess, for, um, for supporting that inclusion and, and perhaps reducing stigma around uh, dementia and cognitive decline. And I guess that's it, Carl's. I think, you know, it is about um, information sharing and education in inverted commas, but, you know, that, that is about culturally appropriate, sensitive information sharing and information um, and appropriate information. Um, and you know, working with destigmatizing um, dementia, but but all of those things, I guess, require a smaller community approach to first understand what is that community feeling and and thinking and doing um, with dementia. So you know, um, I sort of reflect. I was reflecting before when you know we were asking, you know, are our programs going wider, etc. But I was thinking the value of this being in concentrated areas, the work that we've done over the last decade plus has been that we, we get this, you know, very personalised understanding of, you know, what's happening in community. And we can then, I think, translate many of those things out as resources and, you know, various, you know, sort of informations. But... But the value is in that, looking at it at a very, you know, community-based level and then responding appropriately with information. I don't know whether anyone else has anything to add to that. No, I think you're absolutely right. We need more of those kind of localised initiatives as well as sort of national level policy um, to address some of those bigger systemic things as well. Yeah. Now we are at time, so thank you everyone for your attention. And um, just to finish up, I'd like to hand it back to um, Professor Karen Anstey. 
Hey, I'd just like to thank the speakers today. It's been an absolutely uh, wonderful session. I've learned an awful lot and I can tell by the questions that many here have. Um, I'm also really inspired by the speakers and by your teamwork and how you're working together. And I think that there's an awful lot that we can all learn from you and from the speakers today. Um, and I'd also just like to thank the organisers. So thank you to Nikki um, and the Dementia Centre for Research Collaboration for hosting the event. So thank you and hope we have another one of these in the future. So bye.